the spirit of prophecy in the remnant church. Daniel received a mighty vision from the Lord. And Daniel was told in that vision that after 2,300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. In that powerful Sabbath school class yesterday at the Warner Theater, Pastor Willis gave us a precise and interesting overview of this prophecy. And in just a few words, he traced it right down to the beginnings of God's remnant movement in the earth. We plan to develop this further before this year ends. I have been invited to conduct a series, a nightly series, on the sanctuary. It will be a survey series, but I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to offer it to you as a challenge. Those who will follow us into the Bible and through this series will never again wonder if you are members of God's true church. You're going to discover that God pinpointed in prophecy on his grand time scale the emergence of his last church. And so what we say tonight is related to that, and we'll come back to it in review. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, God introduces this 2300-day prophecy and said that at the conclusion of it, the sanctuary would be clear. In Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6, God indicated in reckoning time prophecy a day stands for a year. So prophetically, Daniel was not dealing with 2,300 literal days, but 2,300 years, the longest time prophecy in all the Bible, it extended from 457 B.C. to 1844 A.D., exactly 2,300 years. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, God sent an angel to explain to the prophet what this longest time prophecy meant. And ladies and gentlemen, beyond 1844, There are no more time segments to be allowed for. What I'm trying to say is Christ can finish his work anytime he gets ready. The end can come whenever God is ready. In fact, I would say we are living on borrowed time. Why then has he not come? St. Peter answered the question in 2 Peter, the third chapter. He said the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, with not willing that any should perish. If there seems to be a delay since 1844, it's not because God has forgotten his word. It's because the world is still in spiritual ignorance, and there are good people in all of these communions that walk in error, and because they don't know the truth yet, God forestalls. And probation is protracted. God is simply giving his people time to hear what you have heard at the Warner Theater. And when God sees that every man has had ample opportunity to know his will, make no mistake about it, the end will come. We don't have to wait on any other time prophecies. The last one ended in 1844. Would you say amen out there? Now that angel said to Daniel, when you consider these 2,300 days, which in prophecy are 2,300 years, he said the first 490 years, the first 490 years of the 2,300 are cut off for your people, Daniel, to the Jews, either to get themselves together with God and to be faithful to him 
or they will fill up their cup of iniquity and will have to be rejected as God's chosen people. Now, 490 years were cut off of this 2300-year prophecy as probationary time for the Jews as a nation. And then God said, through the angel, the first 483 years will expire, and then you will be brought to Messiah the Prince. When we do the Sanctuary Survey series, we're going to supply many texts to show you exactly when it started, exactly when the temple was to be finished. It's all in this prophecy. Forty-nine years would bring you to 408 B.C., and the temple was finished that year, just as God said. And then the remaining time of the 483 years would bring the Jews to Messiah. Who is Messiah? If you add 483 years from 457 B.C., you will come down to the year A.D. 27. Now, Jesus was not born in A.D. 27. Instead, he was baptized in A.D. 27. And up until his baptism, as far as the people of Israel were concerned, Christ was just a layman. He was a good man. He was the Son of God. He was without sin, but he had not been anointed Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one. Would you say amen? But in the year A.D. 27, the first cousin of Jesus was out in the wilderness preaching and baptizing. His name was John the Baptist. That same year, when the hand struck in God's great time prophecy clock, A.D. 27, while John was standing waist deep in the river Jordan, there approached the river one who was like unlike all other men. And when John saw him... He said to the crowd, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus, in A.D. 27, walked down into the river Jordan. He was baptized of John, and the Bible says, When he came up out of the water, he knelt on the bank, and God threw back the shutters of heaven and made an announcement to the entire world. God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And at the same time, The Holy Ghost descended upon Christ in the form of a dove, and Jesus was anointed Messiah, the anointed one, anointed by the Holy Ghost, ordained by God the Father. It happened in A.D. 27. Daniel was told, the first 483 years will bring you to Messiah, the Prince. And right on time, Jesus was ordained, and Jesus was anointed, and his ministry began. Would you say amen out there? Now, according to this prophecy that Gabriel interpreted, that left one week. How many days are in a week? Seven days in a week. One week of the 2300-day prophecy left. Now, remember, in reckoning time prophecy, a day for a year. So when we speak of a prophetic week, Seven days, we're literally talking about seven years. Would you say amen? Then Daniel was told, in the midst of the week, Messiah would be cut off. Now remember, he was anointed in A.D. 27. There are seven years left of the 490 years allotted to the Jews to fill up their cup. In the midst of those seven years, Christ would be cut off. Now, for all of you who know a little bit about arithmetic, what is the middle or half of seven? Three and a half. Now I want to ask you, how long did Jesus preach after he was ordained and anointed? Exactly three and a half years. And just as the angel had told Daniel, in the midst of the week, three and a half years after he was anointed by God, Messiah was cut off. And the angel said he would be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus did not die because of his sins. He died because of our sins. Would you say amen out there? The angel said not only would he be cut off, but he would cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus died, he stopped the killing of lambs. When he died, he stopped the shedding of the blood of animals. 
When he died, he stopped killing doves and pigeons. When Jesus died, he caused sacrifice and oblation to cease. St. Paul said he was once offered for the sins of man. And the blood of Jesus only had to be shed that one time. That's why today we who believe in Christ do not take lambs to church and slit their throats for our sins. The Lamb of God has died and he caused sacrifice and oblation to cease. Would you say amen out there? Now that left three and a half years. The Jews had three and a half years left when Jesus died. If you're following me so far, would you say amen? Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Jews have three and a half years of probation left as a nation, either to accept Christ and the Messiah and the will of God, or to fill up their cup of iniquity and have probation closed for them forever as a nation. Three and one half years left out of 490. I want you to be impressed that sooner or later, man's time runs out. God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And that goes for you and me tonight. We do not have forever to make up our minds to follow the Lord. Some of us act like we have forever. The Bible says even the devil knows that he has but a short time. That's why God says today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Behold, now is the accepted time. And so the Jews had three and a half years left. Out of 490 years, when Jesus died on the cross, three and a half years left, I believe that's why the great heart of Jesus was moved with pity, even though he was hanging there, covered with blood and sweat and spit. He was looking down into the faces of madmen. He saw them wagging their heads. He heard them cursing and deriding. He caught their maledictions clearly in his ears. And then all of a sudden, Darkness covered the sun. The earth began to tremble. Lightning flashed. The thunder bellowed. And God came down and shrouded in darkness to be near his son on the cross. Whenever God comes down, all he has to do is bear his arm. And everything that is against him will be smitten dead. It was as though God would kill him right there. Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They are running out of time. Father, they've only got three and a half years later. They don't understand the prophecy, Father. They don't know that probation is about over. Don't kill them now, Father. Even though they are killing me, let them live, Father. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Christ was impressed with the fact that the people to whom he had come were running out of time. I want to tell you that prayer was answered by God. He spared their lives that day. And just 50 days later, 3,000 of those people joined the church on the day of Pentecost. Would you say amen out there? But the Jews as a nation had three and one half years left. Well, how did they spend it? Repenting? No. Seeing what prophecy had said? No. How did they spend those three and a half years? They spent them the way they had spent the others. With arrogance. With pride. Knowing more than God, putting their opinions ahead of the word, and despising those who joined Jesus and his church. Would you say amen out there? Finally, the clock of prophecy struck the hour. The 490 years would end, A.D. 34. Would the Jews repent? Would they change, even though they killed the Son of God? Even they spoke, even though they saw the earthquake? even though they saw the thunder and the lightning, and even though they knew Christ had risen from the dead, would they change? The answer is they did not. They despised Christians. They had the disciples beaten. They had them put in jail. They molested Christians wherever they went. And finally, when the clock struck, A.D. 34, right smack dab on the minute, instead of them turning to Christ and repenting, They went out and took one of his deacons to make an example out of him. That deacon's name was Stephen. And they took Stephen because he loved Jesus. And because he believed in Jesus. And because he taught about Jesus. They took deacon Stephen outside the city. And they all got great big rocks. And now they're going to judge Stephen. And they started pelting him with those rocks. 
And as they were putting him to death, the Bible says that Stephen looked up and he saw heaven open. And when he realized what they were doing, he prayed the same prayer Jesus had prayed. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen said, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Stephen was pleading with God for more time, but time had run out. And on that very day, when they stoned Stephen, the 490 years of Jewish probation ended, and standing in the crowd while they killed Stephen was a man named Saul holding the coats. It wasn't long after that he was arrested on the road to Damascus, and God called this learned man and said, Now, we're not talking to the Jews any longer. I'm making you the apostle to the Gentiles. I have rejected the Jews. Their 490 years are up. I will save Jews one at a time, but no longer are they my chosen people. That's why Paul said to the Gentiles, Jesus now has torn down the middle wall of partition. He has made of Jew and Gentile one in Christ Jesus. Don't let anybody hassle you about Passover and Pentecost and all those annual Sabbath days. Don't let anybody judge you according to Jewish law. We are now in the Christian era, and I am called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. It's no longer just Jews, but whosoever will, let him come. And that day, probation ended for the Jews, and from that day until this, it has been the gospel to all the world. Would you say amen out there? Now, I've only taken care of 490 years of 2300. If you subtract 490 from 2300, that leaves 1810. And if you add 1810 years from AD 34, when the probation ran out for the Jews, and when they stoned Stephen, you come to the year 1844. 1844, October 22. Now, some of you heard Dr. Willis talking about that yesterday, didn't you? And he talked about something that was going to happen in 1844. It was a significant date. Finally, we came down through the Dark Ages. The Protestant Reformation had broken the stranglehold of the papacy on the world. The Word of God was now going out to the common man, and people were studying the prophecies. All of a sudden, there came the dark day of May 19, 1780. And not long after that, there came the falling stars of November 12 and 13, 1833. And when men saw that, they went running to their Bibles to try to figure out what it meant. And when they began to study their Bibles, God revealed to them that these were signs that Jesus was getting ready to come back. Well, everybody wanted to know, when is he coming? And so we find scholars from all denominations began to study. And they began to get together. And they began to listen to lecturers. A man by the name of William Miller was one of those lecturers. He discovered this prophecy in Daniel concerning 1844. Would you say amen out there? And as they studied it, they became convicted that that was the date the Lord would come. Because Daniel had been told after 2,300 years, the sanctuary would be cleansed. They took that to mean that Christ was coming to do away with sin. They traced the date and computed it to October 22, 1844. There was no such thing as a Seventh-day Adventist in those days. There were Baptists and there were Methodists and there were Congregationalists. And there were all of these Protestant churches that had come out of the mother church. Are you following me? They are the legitimate daughters of the Roman church. They came out of her like daughters. They took the name Protestant, which was supposed to mean we protest what you teach. But they didn't. They held on to the dogma, to the teachings of the church, chiefest amongst which is Sunday observance. Would you say amen out there? So they were not Protestants at all. All of a sudden, God tries to wake them up and turn them from man-made tradition to the Word of God. And when they looked in the Word of God, they became convicted that Christ was getting ready to come. And through a mistake, they nailed it to 1844, the end of the 2300-year prophecy. Yesterday, you had Pastor Willis tell you about Revelation chapter 10 in connection with this prophecy. The bitter, sweet experience. Here in Revelation, John was told to take a little book out of the angel's hand and eat it. He was told that when he ate it, it would be sweet in his mouth, 
but bitter in his belly. When the saints back there in the 1800s began to read and to think that Christ was coming, it was sweet. Oh, it was sweet. They thought they had discovered the very day he would come. And they began to preach it. The Baptists preached it. The Congregationalists preached it. The Presbyterians preached it. And threw out of the churches a common people whose main objective was to be ready for the coming of the Lord. By the thousands they joined this group. And they were called Adventists. Not Seventh-day Adventists. Just Adventists. All it meant was, we believe that Christ is about to make his advent. And it was sweet in their mouths. If you're following me, say amen. But when they got down to October 21, many of them had sold their homes. Many of them had given away their bank accounts. Many of them had given away teams of horses. Many of them had turned palms over to other people. They knew that in one more day, Christ was going to come. And they went to the churches that night. And you can imagine what you would do if you thought Christ would come tomorrow. You wouldn't be as you are tonight. You'd be on your knees confessing your sins. You'd be talking to God all night long. And that's what they did all night long. But on October 22, 1844, the sun came up as usual. The people were out looking up. Searching the sky, trying to see if the cloud would appear. All day long, they were looking. And as the day wore on, the dejectors and the mockers and the laughers began to gather around these people and to make fun of them. And finally, it got to be three o'clock in the afternoon and Jesus had not come. After a while, it got to be five o'clock in the afternoon and Jesus had not come. Now the sun sets rather early in October. And they knew that if he didn't hurry up and get there, they were going to be disappointed. And finally, they saw the sky begin to turn red in the west. And they saw the sun begin to sink behind the horizon. And Jesus had not come. All of a sudden, the mocking and the laughter became deafening. People were pointing the finger. Those who had gotten free horses and free houses and free farms were laughing to to kill themselves. And these dear people were about to enter into the most distressing thing they had ever known in their lives. Finally, the sun began to sink. And you, you've seen it sink when half of it drops behind the hill. They stood watching. They got half a sun. If Jesus doesn't come in the next few minutes, we will not see him at all. We will have made a mistake. Finally, they got one third of the sun showing. They kept looking for Jesus. Finally, they only see the top of the sun as it's fast sinking behind the western horizon. And in a few moments, it was gone. All was left was the afterglow. They thought maybe as long as the sky is red, he will come. But finally, it began to get dark. And the stars came out as usual. And all of a sudden, it began to dawn on them. We've made a mistake. We didn't get it right. We've made a mistake. And the people were laughing. And the people were mocking. And they were pointing the finger. And these folk now saw that thing that had been so sweet turn bitter in the belly. And when it turned dark that evening, ladies and gentlemen, some of them lost hope forever in Christ. Some of them became atheists. Some of them became infidels. At best, they became agnostics. Some of them said, let's set up some little groups and stay together and see what will happen. So you began to get the Seventh-day Baptists. Somebody sent me some questions in on that down there at the, at the hall. And you began to get other groups. I mean groups that became the Seventh-day Baptists. And groups that became the Russellites, which became the Jehovah's Witnesses. Are you listening to me? These were products of the disappointment. It was bitter. Can you imagine how you would have felt if you had thought Christ was coming that day and he didn't? But out of all of these disillusioned people, there was a little group. Let's say amen now. Out of all of these people, there was a little group of folk whose faith in God was not shaken. They began to beckon one another. They were almost embarrassed to call their names out loud. But they knew who each other was. 
And so they would just call. Well, what's going on? We're going to meet over at so-and-so's house. We're going to talk this thing through. We're going to do some praying over there. We're going to see what went wrong. And when they all got together in this home, this little group that was left over, they too, shaken and disappointed, they dropped down on their knees. They began to pour out their hearts toward God. And they said, oh, Lord, we know that you're too wise to make a mistake. And if a mistake has been made, it ain't you, it's us. Now, Lord, we're coming to you humbly. If sin is standing in the way, we confess our sins. If there's something you want us to do, we're willing to do it. If there's something you want us to do that we don't know about, just show us, Lord. Whatever it is you want, tell us and we'll do it. Only reveal thy will to us and show us where we went wrong. As they prayed and as they fasted, it became clear to one of those leaders that they had simply made a mistake in what was to happen in 1844. This was a prophetic date of great significance. It was a time when God's remnant church would be called into being because the angel who gave John the bitter sweet experience said, after your belly turns bitter, there's a work to be done. Thou must prophesy again to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It will not be the end of time. It will be the time when God's last church will go into all the world and preach the last warning message. And when they studied, God revealed it to them. God showed them that it's not the time for Jesus to come. It's time for the last message to go out. For men are breaking my commandments and don't even know it. Men are eating things they shouldn't and don't even know it. Men are drinking and don't even know it's harmful for them. Men are smoking and don't even know it's dangerous for them. Men are living contrary to my will. Good men and good women and they don't even know it. So I'm going to call into being a church. And I'm going to give them wisdom above everything else. I'm going to give them knowledge of the Word of God. I'm going to give them a message that even their enemies cannot confound. I'm going to give them a message that those who hate them cannot refute. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not fools. When you hear us stand down there at that hall and answer every question that comes in, we're not that smart. Are you listening to me? And when we stand up there and tell you we'll give you a million dollars for a text, we don't have any million dollars. What we got is not a million dollars, but a foolproof message. Would you say amen? We got one that the wisest critics in the world cannot confound. Don't you know that if the great ministers of Washington, D.C. could, they would refute it? Don't you know if they could collect, they would collect? Don't you know if they could shut my mouth, they would shut my mouth? Why don't you think somebody came down to collect? It's because God decided to give to his last church a message that will stand up. And tonight I'm happy to tell you, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is seeking sand. Would you say amen out there? Now as these little group, this little group was studying and God was making things clear, God said to himself, now I finally got me some folks I can trust with all the gifts of the Spirit. He said, I'm going to give them something that other folks don't have. And I want to turn over and read something to you now. I'm going on over to the giving of the gifts in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says, wherefore, he said, this is verse 8, please listen, verse 8 of Ephesians 4. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, what are these gifts? Verse 11, he gave some apostles, and some prophets. Some what? We're talking about prophets now. He gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. All right, Lord, we got that. You gave away the gift of prophecy. You gave away the gift of apostleship. You gave away the gift of teaching. You gave away the gift of evangelism. We got that. But why? Why did you give your church that? Listen, verse 12. For, here's the, here's why. For the perfecting of the saints. Are the saints perfect yet? God says, I'm giving these gifts for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Let's say amen out there. Look at here, Pastor Brooks. Look here, Pastor Willis. 
Listen here, Elder Palmer. Listen here, Pastor Richardson. Listen here, Chuck Sandifer. Listen, brethren. You need something special in this ministry. You need some information that other folks don't have. In other words, God says, there are some people so close to me that I'm going to bend over and whisper in their ears, and I'm going to give them some inside information. I'm going to make some things clear to them that other men can study for 50 years and never find out. Well, Lord, why did you give us these gifts? I'm giving it for the work of the ministry. I want my preachers to be better equipped than ordinary men. I want them to understand the details of prophecy. Anybody can read the general and broad lines, but I want my men to read between the lines. Therefore, I'm going to give them these gifts for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. And God says, edify my church. Build them up. Don't just tell them, thou shalt not kill, but let them know that if they take poison, they're killing themselves. Let them know if they smoke cigarettes, they're killing themselves. Well, Lord, why didn't you tell them? Because they didn't smoke cigarettes when I finished the Bible. i got to give you another gift so that they will understand the details, so that the commandments in all their broadness will be made plain to folks living in the last generation. Would you say amen out there? Then it says, how long, Lord, are you going to let us have these gifts? You listening? How long? Verse 13. Till. Verse 12 says, for. Verse 13 says, till. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Let's say amen. Are all the children home yet? That's why we ran the meeting at the Warner Theater. God brought some more into the unity of the faith. But there are more to come. We're going to have a baptism Sabbath because there are more to come. There are going to be meetings run around here until Jesus says stop. We're going to keep on using these gifts until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that should be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You can go to one church, it's just like another. Just like George Wallace said about the Republican and Democratic parties. twiddly D and twiddly dumb. But all of a sudden, you come into a faith that's different. Would you say amen out there? You come into a faith that teaches the whole Bible. You come into a faith that believes all of God's law. You come into a faith that not only tells you about your soul, but they tell you what to eat, and they tell you what to drink. And they tell you what to leave off. They tell you how to dress. God has a holistic message. He wants you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospereth. And God says, I've given those gifts for that reason until all my work is finished. What you say, man? Now the gift of prophecy in 1844 was given to this church. God, first of all, gave it to a white man. Hazen Foss. But because the message was straight, he was too nervous to bear it. God then turned to a black man, William Foy. Amen? You're going to learn all this as you go along. His name was William Foy. He was a mulatto. One of his parents was white. And William Foy received this message, and he too did not have the nerve to give it. By the way, Hazen Foss, once he heard the message, said, that's what God told me to do, and now I'm a lost man. William Foy tried to tell the message, the black man, but folk wouldn't listen to him. And finally, God reached down and got the weakest of the weak. There was a young woman in that group looking for Jesus to come. Her name was Ellen Gould Harmon. Would you say amen out there? Because of an accident when she was just a child... She had been given up to die. She was subject to all kinds of sicknesses. She had to drop out of school. She only got a third grade education. But she loved the Lord. And I've been trying to tell you, if you have to choose between consecration and education, take the consecration. Would you say amen out there? God chose this young woman who hadn't even gone to school. And he laid on her the gift of prophecy. And while they were praying and asking God for light, 
God caused her to go off in vision. And God told her, I'm depending on you to tell my people. That woman since then has written hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages and scores and scores of books. The language is sublime. Dr. Billy Graham preaches from Desire of Ages. And whenever I hear Dr. Billy Graham preach, I sit and I listen to him. And when he gets to talking about Jesus on the cross, I say to myself, there goes our prophetess. Because he's quoting us almost verbatim. Would you say amen out there? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the gift in the remnant church. It's not another Bible. She never called herself a prophet on par with John the Revelator or with Daniel. But she said, I am the Lord's servant. And he has given me messages to make his word clear. Not a new Bible, but light shed on the greater light. Would you say amen? Or say? Well, how do you know she was a prophet? What are some of the signs that a person is a true prophet? I'm going to give them to you fast because I'm running out of time. Number one, one of the signs is that a true prophet will not use a gift to become rich. They're not going to sell advice and counsel. Come on, say amen now. I'm being very practical with you. A true prophet is not going to make so much money she can go off and buy great ranches. And yeah. That's one sign. I want you to listen to me carefully. Another is, not only do they not seek personal fortune, but they don't seek personal fame. Would you say amen out there? They don't do it to become big shots and to get written up in the history books. Another one is, a true prophet will always glorify Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? Tonight we intended to give all the new believers a little book she wrote called Steps to Christ. Over 12 million copies have, have been sold in hundreds of languages. Some of you got them as gifts down at the Warner Theater. I want you to read it, and I want you to judge for yourself if the Lord's servant glorifies Christ. I want you to judge for yourself if you believe a third grade student could write in such sublime language. I want you to read it, and you'll be the judge. I want you to see if the prophet is lifted up or if Jesus is lifted up. But the supreme work is desire of ages. One day it is said somebody went into the Library of Congress. And they spoke to the man in charge of the religious library. And they said to him, what is the greatest and grandest biography of Christ in all the Library of Congress? He responded, that's easy. It's Desire of Ages by Ellen G. White. Would you say amen, Hunter? Out in California, there was a professor of literature with a phenomenal memory. And when her class came in, in order to orient them, she would offer a challenge. She would say, tomorrow... I want you to copy out a few paragraphs from your favorite book. And when you walk into this class, I'm going to tell you what the book is and what the author is. And so all the people began to reach for their favorite authors. But there was in that class a Seventh-day Adventist student. And that student, I am told, went to Desire of Ages and copied down one of those sublime passages about our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he came into the class, finally it was his turn. He stood up and he read it. And when he finished, the professor said to the entire class with a solemn voice, that comes from a book that is too little read and too little understood. It comes from the greatest writers of our time. It comes from Desire of Ages by Ellen G. White. Would you say amen out there? I challenge you. Go look at it and see for yourself. You don't have to take our word for it. Not only that, the Bible says to the law. To what? And to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. In other words, whoever calls himself a prophet must never contradict God's Ten Commandments and never contradict the rest of the Bible. If you believe that, say amen. Anybody who says he's a true prophet and writes contrary to the word of God is not a true prophet at all. Now, let's go on quickly. Another thing, and of course this is included in what I've just told you, a true prophet never contradicts the Word of God. Now I'm going to do something I don't like to do, but I, and you'll have to forgive me, but I've got to do it tonight. And this is out of character for me, 
But at the same time, God raised up a true prophet. The devil always counterfeits whatever God gives. God gave marriage, the devil gives common law. God gave the Sabbath, the devil gives the first day of the week. And when God gave us a true prophet in the last days, the devil ran and got him son. And amongst them was Mary Baker Eddy of the Christian Science Church. She began to prophesy at about the same time the gift was placed in the remnant church. And alongside her was Joseph Smith of the Mormon Church. Are you listening to me? They began to do their work the same year that Ellen White was called to be the prophet of the remnant church. Well, now, look here. Every night I preach to you, I put myself right up in the same line with everybody else, didn't I? I told you I might be a false prophet, didn't I? I told you the only way you could tell whether I was false or true was to study and see if I stayed with the Bible, didn't I? Well, that's how you tell if the prophet is true or false. Mary Baker Eddy taught things that are contrary to the Word of God. She can't be the true prophetess. Joseph Smith taught it was all right to have 25 or 30 wives. The Bible contradicts that. I'd rather stand with the Word of God than go with the Mormons. The Mormons teach that you can be baptized for the dead. The Bible says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no wisdom nor knowledge in the grave whither thou goest. Would you say amen or say? So ladies and gentlemen, because these prophets and all others contradict the Word of God, they have to be characterized as false prophets. Now, the next way you can tell if a true prophet is a true prophet, what that prophet declares must come to pass. That has always been God's uh, system. God says, I declare it before it happens. That proves that I am the Lord. A true prophet makes a prediction. It's got to happen. I want to tell you something. Way back there, when we were just a handful of people, just getting started, God told the true prophet that this message would melt the world. God told the true prophet when they first printed a few magazines and handed them out, she said the publishing work would belt the entire earth and the printed word would go out like the leaves of autumn. It has happened, ladies and gentlemen. Publishing houses in 800 languages and dialects. Would you say amen out there? There are hundreds of thousands of people who spread the printed word every day, just as the Lord had prophesied. But that isn't all. Whenever a true prophet speaks, and whatever a true prophet says might be discounted for a while. But when God's behind the thing, you can just put a pin in it. Way back yonder, before we ever found out anything, God's true prophet said that cancer was a virus. The medical profession laughed. Ha, ha, ha. Who ever heard of such ignorance? Today, the medical profession has finally caught up with Ellen G. White. They are saying that cancer is a virus. Would you say amen or say? Way back yonder, when everybody thought it was cute to smoke cigarettes, the servant of the Lord said that nicotine was a debilitating drug, that it was harmful to the brain, that it was harmful to the body. And the world laughed. And for years, as we preached it, the world laughed at us. But all of a sudden, the Surgeon General of the United States caught up with the spirit of prophecy. The Surgeon General said, on every pack of cigarettes, you've got to print a warning. It's dangerous to your health. On every billboard advertising, you've got to print a warning. It's dangerous to your health. Well, I knew that long before the Surgeon General knew it, and he's a hundred times smarter than I am. How did I know? I got it from the spirit of prophecy. Would you say amen or say? Now the last thing about a true prophet, they got to live right. You know prophet when you got four or five women you're chasing. You might be a prophet, but you're not a true one. You're not a true prophet when people uh, finally catch up with you and discover you're living all kinds of dirty lives. Uh, well, I won't say you ought to read some of these biographies of these other prophets. I won't say it. Even the enemies of this woman decided that she was a Christian if ever there was one. There was a man who was a member of this church. He was a minister of the gospel. But for fame and for fortune, he was flattered into departing from the faith. 
His name was Ken Wright. He had been one of the ministers of this church. He had been associated with this woman and her husband. He had been a powerful leader and a very gifted man. But the Baptist church came along and offered him a great big building, bigger than any he had. They offered him money such as he never had before. They told him to write a book against the faith, and they would pay him and buy his book. And Ken Wright did like a lot of folk. He sold out to the devil. But then this servant of the Lord said to him, Brother Ken Wright, repent. He wouldn't repent. Finally, she said to him, Brother Ken Wright, your son will step in obscurity. Are you listening to me? Ladies and gentlemen, the man was crippled. He lost his family. He came down to poverty. The books didn't sell. And whenever he wanted food, he walked into the back door of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, one of our hospitals, in order to get a free handout from the church he denounced. Are you listening to me? He died like a bull. But Ellen White died before he did. She was buried from the Battle Creek Tabernacle. And when he found out she was dead, he came to the funeral. And he wept all the way down the aisle. And he stood there with his hands on the carpet and his tears dropping down on the inanimate clay. And he said in the hearing of all those gathered for the funeral, he said, there is a good woman. There is a child of God. They had to drag him away from the coffin. He asked to be allowed to go back one more time. He turned around and he went back and he stood there with his tears raining down into the coffin. And surely as God lives, his son did set in obscurity. He died like a hobo. It does not pay to kick against the bricks. You can't stop the work of the Lord by kicking. All you're going to do is breed mortification in your big toe. All you're going to do is hurt yourself. You cannot denounce what God has built up. You cannot turn back what God has begun. Would you say amen out there? God gave to this church, through this gift of prophecy, the details that are left out of our Bible so that we might have the unity of the faith. That's one of the reasons that all of us preachers preach the same message. That's why I can go to Egypt, and when an interpreter sits down beside me and begins to tell me what the preacher is saying, he's preaching the same message that you heard at the Warner Theater. That's why around the world, this church has one faith, one Lord, one baptism. No other church has it on the top side of the earth. You can go right here in Washington, D.C., and you can pull together ten pastors of the same church, and they all have different views on heaven and on hell and on everything else. But in this church, we believe one message. Why is that? God gave gifts to the church that we might be brought into the unity of the faith. Would you say amen out there? Therefore, beloved, I conclude this message tonight with this statement from Second Chronicles 20 and verse 20. God says, believe his prophets and you will prosper. Would you say amen out there? Some people hate the spirit of prophecy the way they hate the Bible. And the reason they hate it is because it condemns sin. And the Bible seemed to let them slide a little bit. Are you listening to me? The Bible appeared to let them by because it didn't go into the details. See, the Bible doesn't say anything about a disco. The Bible doesn't say anything about wild music. You all didn't leave, did you? Let me hear you say amen. So people who were looking for loopholes would say, well, there must not be anything wrong with wild music because the Bible doesn't mention it. That's why God sent the spirit of prophecy. God sent the spirit of prophecy to fill in the detail. God sent the spirit of prophecy to talk about things that only this generation knows about. And they don't like it. They consider it cold water. They consider it a hindering cause. They consider it something that takes the sparkle out of life. They don't like the spirit of prophecy for the same reason sinners don't like the Bible. They condemn it because much of it condemns them. But I'm reminded of a man. This is an allegory. I'm reminded of a man who went hunting one day with a bow and an arrow. And while he was hunting, he came upon a lion. He saw the lion, but the lion didn't see him. 
And so he took one of his sharp, barbed arrows. He put it in his bow. He drew it taut, and he let it fly. And according to the a- allegory, that arrow caught that great lion right behind his front leg. And oh, it was painful. That lion rolled over and over and over, trying to dislodge the arrow. That lion couldn't stand the discomfort. That lion was not enjoying an arrow caught in its hide. And so it growled, and it fussed, and it roared. And finally, it was trying to bite the arrow, trying to pull it out. Then the arrow spoke to the lion. The arrow said, Oh, great king of the jungle, Oh, great king of the jungle, if thou canst not abide me, how canst thou abide him that sent me? If I, caught in your flesh, am causing you so much trouble, how can you stand before the hunter who has a thousand arrows like me? If you can't take me, how are you going to take him that sent me? Ladies and gentlemen, if God's word is too straight for you, if the spirit of prophecy is too straight for you, how are you going to abide him that sent it? If the spirit of prophecy is too holy, how are you going to abide Jesus, who is the holy of the holiest? Would you say amen out there? If you can't stand the message of the servant of the Lord, how are you going to stand the word of the Lord himself? Amen! I thank God tonight for everything he's done for the remnant church. And you know what, folks? You know what? By his grace, I plan to go through all the way. I plan to go through. Shining upon me from heaven so bright, I bathe the world with its falling of dew. For I've started, started with Jesus. And I'm going through. I'm going through. Yes, I'm going through. I'll pay the price. Whatever. Started with Jesus, and I'm going through many there are yes who start in this race, but with the light they Then others accept it just because it is new. But not, not very many expect to go through. But I'm going through, yeah.
with the Lord, despise the few. For I've started, started with Jesus, and I'm going through. I'd rather walk just with Jesus alone and have for a pillow. Like Jacob, just a stone, but living each moment with his dear face in the view. Then shrink, shrink from my pathway and fail to go through. But I Beloved, did you get that message? Now, it's not an easy road. The way to destruction is broad and easy. But the Lord said he would never leave you, nor forsake you. He said, my yoke is easy. Now, I'm a country boy, and I've seen a lot of yokes. But I've never seen a yoke made for one ox. A yoke is made for a team. The Lord said, now, my yoke is easy. You get in one side, and I'm going to get in the other side. And I'm going to pull with you. I'm not going to leave you out there by yourself. The devil will get mad, and folks will raise the devil, but my yoke is easy. Whenever the burden gets hard, just fall back a little and let me pull. My yoke is easy. I'm going to be in there with you. And tonight, beloved, it's a happy way. It's a way of joy. It's a way of peace. It's a way of consolation. It's a way of confidence. You're not just going along hoping things will turn out all right. You know things are going to turn out all right. Because you know you're walking with Jesus. And tonight, I am going through. By His grace, I am going through. You know what? We may promise each other tonight that we're going to meet in God's kingdom. That's not presumptuous because the Lord has opened the way. We can do it. We can make it through dangers seen and unseen, through many toils and snares. We can make it through persecution. We can make it through backbiting and gossiping. We can make it no matter what happens. We can go through. I'm telling you tonight, I'm going through. I want to know are you planning to go to. If you are, I want you to stand up as Pastor Bates sings this song. This first and chorus one more time. Lord, I've started to walk in this light, shining upon me from a heaven so bright. I bade the world with its Follies ado, for I've started, started with Jesus, and I'm going through. I'm going through, yes, I'm going through. I'm
to the Lord is my view. For I started, started with Jesus, and I'm going to. You mean it, folks? If you do, say amen. Look, don't play with God now. If you mean it, you can do it. I'm going through. You mean it? Before our president prays with us and dismisses this meeting, Pastor Willis has asked me to say what's on my heart. This place should be full tonight. Perhaps because we couldn't be sure we could have this place tonight until almost the last minute, perhaps folk misunderstood. In fact, we know some did. So I'm going to ask you to do two things, and if you'll do it, after I ask each, I want you to say amen. Number one, will you be here Wednesday night on time? Now, you need to be here. We don't do this for exercise. We don't have the uneasy vanity that we've got to be up preaching. All of us, after what we've been through, would like to go on a vacation. We are here because we need to be here. Would you say amen? Now, you don't get this building free, and we're not laying charges on you. Again, at sacrifice, we're here because we need to be here. Will you be here Wednesday night? Now, secondly, let's call all these church members who misunderstood. Let's bring them. Would you say amen? Now, don't play with me now. Or will you do it if you will say amen? Let me ask you one more thing. Have you felt it was profitable to be here tonight? If so, raise your hand. Put your hands down a minute, please. How many of you understood the message? Raise your hand. You thank God for it. It's going to get clearer and clearer. Then let's do that. Let's make a commitment here tonight that we're going through. Going through. And if your religion is just a burden, then you're not converted. Good religion is not a burden, it's a blessing. Not a problem, it's a privilege. We'll ask the President now to confirm these decisions with us. In a closing prayer of benediction, may God bless you. I'm so glad I could be with you. We're going to continue here on Sunday evenings and Wednesday evenings. Sunday evenings, is that right? And Wednesday evenings, we're going to have this room for this purpose. And it doesn't have to be C.D. Brooks. These men are scholars. You've heard them. These men know the Bible. They know the things we're talking about. And we're going to study together. Let's get something in these heads of ours. Too much religion now based on emotionalism. Folk wanting to shout when they got nothing to be shouting about. Or to be crying and sighing for abominations done in Israel. And all they want to do is shout. Let us be different. Let's get something in these heads of ours. And then we'll be like a tree planted by the river of water that shall not be moved. When the storms of life are raging, we won't be like a reed in a windstorm. But we'll stand anchored to the rock Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what we want, isn't it? Surely we can thank the Lord for giving us health and strength, giving us the desire to be here tonight, and then making it so that we could understand the plain preaching of the word of truth. Shall we bow our heads? Our Father... Again, we thank Thee for Jesus Christ, who loved us so much that He was willing to come, brave the cold and the darkness, to find lost sheep. And, oh, Father, we thank Thee for sending Him. And then we thank again, O oh Lord, that though we have strayed away, that he came out and caught us, found us caught in the thicket, put us on his bosom, carried us back to the fold. For that we do thank thee tonight. We thank thee for the Holy Word and how that holy men inspired by the Holy Ghost wrote. And then, O oh Father, we thank thee for thy manservant tonight who went into the wells of wisdom, reached there, poured forth his soul to ours, that we may understand plain words of truth. We thank thee tonight, O oh Father, that we do understand. 
Now, Father, as we stand committing ourselves to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray, O oh Father, that you would protect and keep us, that you would strengthen our decision. As we submit our wills, O oh Father, energize our wills with the Holy Ghost and his power, that we may be willing to do what thou hast asked us to do, willing to go where you have asked us to go. Father, we thank thee for, the, for thy messenger who has given us a light to share on the greater light. So as we stutter, study the light, may we take the lesser light and then apply it to our darkened souls that the light of truth may shine forth there. Now, Father, as we take leave of this place, we go to our different places of abode, give us rest, give us peace, give us joy, give us happiness. Then, as we sleep during the night, protect us from dangers, seen and unseen and unseen. We lay our heads upon the pillow. Give us that deep rest so that we need not take any tranquilizers to sleep, but so that we can sleep in Jesus. Then, as the sun dawns for the brighter brightness of the day, we pray that the rays of the righteousness of the Son of Jesus Christ will shine in our hearts, that we rise from our bed, that we'll hear the words of truth saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Keep us throughout the day. Give us the courage to call our friends and invite them to be here. Give us the strength and the courage ourselves to be here, that we may hear again the words of truth applied to our souls, that we may live day by day, and in every way, to become better and better Christians. Protect us through the night, save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International Copyright American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. To order CDs or audio cassettes of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 1-800-233-4450. International calls, please dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. American Cassette Ministries is not a one-man band. It's an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Cassette Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. Our email address is info at americancassette.org. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and financial support are important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon.